Welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were looking at uh, First Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 3, where Paul is listing out what uh, kind of characteristics uh, that older women in the church should have. So he says they should, they should be reverent in their behavior. Yes, Titus. Yes, Titus. Did I say Timothy? Okay, sorry. Uh, Titus, we were looking at Titus chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 3, sorry. Uh, so used to saying Timothy, 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 and uh, so Titus chapter 2, verse 3, we're looking at uh, the qualities that uh, older women should have. They should be reverent in behavior, uh, not slanderous, um, and not given to much wine. So you know, basically, uh, this was a problem for uh, the older folks at Rome and Greek, the Roman and Greek culture, the older folks, uh, you know, especially were intoxicated to drink because, uh, you know, they used to drink to get rid of, uh, you know, or overcome their aches and pains and uh, to drown their loneliness and uh, depression. And even as they, they drink it for these reasons, they become addicted uh, to wine. And we know that, you know, when you're intoxicated with uh, a strong drink like wine, you know, you, uh, you end up talking too much and you talk unnecessary things and you can sin. And also, you know, getting intoxicated to wine is a um, uh, sin because we are not relying on the Lord uh, 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 for him to heal us. We're not relying on him to help us overcome our challenges of, um, of uh, old age, of loneliness, of depression. And uh, hence, you know, we give in to, uh, uh, to drinking uh, of all of these strong things. And so he, say, he says, you know, not given to much wine. Uh, the word given in the Greek is the word doulo, or uh, which we get doulos, the word doulos, which means uh, slave or those who are in bondage. So basically he says, do not give in too much wine. He means, you know, do not become enslaved or into bondage or become slaves to drinking um, uh, wine. And then he says, you know, they should be teachers of good things. They need to teach uh, the word of God, um, uh, not only through the way of, uh, not only to teaching, but also to their way of life, the way they live holy and upright lives, they are, uh, can set a good example. And then he says these godly women should be uh, spirit controlled in every part of their life. They should exercise, um, uh, you know, uh, godliness in every area of their life. And uh, they are not to be slaves of any kind of substance or any kind of amusement, fashion, or anything, but they must live to please their uh, masters. And then he goes on to talk about um, uh, younger women and younger men in the church in verses 4 to 8. Uh, can one of you read verses 4 to 8 before one of you can read verses 4 to 8? Do you have any questions? Verses 1 to 3? Titus chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Okay, if there are no questions, then we'll move on to verses 4 to 8. So one of you can please read verses 4 to 8, please. Can I read, Pastor? Yes, sure. Go ahead, Asha. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their teacher, and to love their children, to be discreet, just chastised from neighbors, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blessed. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So here he starts by saying that they admonish the young women, which means he's saying, He's not telling Titus that you are to 
you know, uh, teach, uh, of course you teach everyone, but you are not to personally teach or minister to young women. It's the older women who have to teach and minister to uh, young women directly. Okay, so directly the older women should uh, preach, teach, minister to uh, the younger women. And so he says, you know, instead you are to equip and encourage the older women to teach the younger women. And he says, admonish. Now, uh, if you look at this word admonish in the KJV, it says uh, teach. The NIV version, it says train. And in the um, uh, NAS version, it says encourage. So the context and the word imply that this was uh, to be a process of teaching, explaining, encouraging, training, and holding young women or young wives to a standard that was not familiar to them, that was unfamiliar to them, and yet was important, uh, you know, uh, to have successful marriages and uh, families. So this whole word admonish is basically, you know, a process where you are teaching, continually teaching, explaining, encouraging, training uh, these young wives, these young women who are not familiar with all of these things, but it is important that you admonish them so that you know they are successful in their marriages and their uh, families. Now, why will we say that they are unfam unfamiliar? Because they come from pagan backgrounds and they are unfamiliar with the Christian way of life. So it is important, this important that these godly women who are much older in age, you know, are able to teach them uh, uh, not only the doctrines, but every other aspect of um, life. So the Greek word admonish here basically means to train someone in self-control, uh, restore to senses, and exhort earnestly. Okay. So uh, Paul says that the older women are to admonish these younger women in seven areas. The first thing is to love their husbands, which is... Uh, which I'm not going to elaborate on because it's uh, uh, much because, you know, it's quite uh, uh, obvious what the statement is. But, you know, just like you mentioned that uh, most husbands in the Roman and Greek culture, they, you know, uh, they thought their wives were just to, uh, you know, uh, take care of the home and uh, take care of the children. Uh, and most husbands used to look for emotional love outside uh, marriage. But when uh, they received salvation, it stopped the immorality in most believing men uh, uh, in the culture that they came from or uh, in their context. But salvation uh, did not, uh, you know, make them uh, very close or intimate or life-sharing friends with uh, or lovers with their wives. And hence, you know, uh, Paul is mentioning this here that they need to love their hu husbands uh, in a way that is more close, intimate. They have a life sharing friendship with them, uh, uh, you know, in, in a very close, intimate uh, way. So, you know, he's saying uh, that these young women should love their husbands and they will only be able to love their husbands when these older women are able to set that example and show that kind of love and intimacy in their relationship with their spouse. The younger women will also follow suit. The next one is to love their children. So basically, that's also very, very, uh, uh, you know, I don't need to explain that, very direct. Then he says to be discreet. The word discreet in the Greek means self-controlled. It means to be controlled in one's passion. Uh, then he says they have to be chaste, which means, uh, you know, the Greek word for chaste here means incorrect, pure, uh, sorry, innocent, pure, clean and perfect. So in the areas of their sexual purity, you know, they have to be innocent, pure, clean and uh, perfect. Uh, they have homemakers, you know, young women who are taking care of their homes, their children. They need to uh, be, you know, totally concerned about the home affairs, not running from home to home, spending time in idle talk and gossiping. Uh, they need to be good uh, and in this, the context here, it means uh, kind to servants, uh, kind to those who are poor and strangers because they are at home. They'll have to entertain um, 
and show hospitality to people, to those who are poor in the church, to strangers, and uh, meet their needs. So that is their other, other responsibility. And good is in this context is talking about good. And they have to be obedient to their husbands. They need to be submissive to their husbands in their marriage relationship. Uh, and why do they need to do all of these things so that the word of God may not be uh, blasphemed? So, you know, some of them, uh, wives have become believers, their husbands are still unbelievers. So when they live and conduct their lives in such a way, you know, uh, it will not provoke their husbands to stop them from going to church or stop them from continuing to be believers or stop them from reading, the, uh, uh, you know, believing in Christ. But um, they will not be provoked also to speaking bad about uh, Christ and the gospel. But it will just lead them to also knowing uh, Christ as their Lord and Savior and lead them also to their personal <clears throat> uh, salvation. So these are the seven areas where the older women should admonish the younger women. And then he goes on in verse 6 and says, uh, likewise, uh, exhort young men uh, to be uh, sober-minded, okay? So here, uh, likewise, he's linking verse 6 to the earlier verses. It shows that uh, what the young men need to learn isn't very different from what the younger or the older men and women need to learn. Uh, it might slightly differ because of their age group, but essentially the message of godly living is just the same as the other age groups as well. So it says younger men should be sober-minded. You know, we see that uh, Paul repeats this word sober-minded repeatedly in his letters, and he uses it again here with the reference to these young men. Um, you know, and uh, sober-minded, as we know, we have studied this before, it means to be self-controlled, to have control over one's passions, to have sound judgment, and uh, this single word, sober-minded, captures the main quality that young men need if they are to be godly. And uh, in verse 7, he goes on to say that, you know, in all things they should show themselves in pattern of good work, in good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. So um, Paul you knows talking about these young men uh, and uh, 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 now he directly turns to Timothy who sorry directly turns to Titus uh, who is a young man himself and he's telling uh, Titus who's probably in his 30s uh, he's telling him four areas where he needs to be an example so here he's moving on from uh, from a general category of um, young men to a specific person, and that is Titus. And he's telling Titus, you know, there, these are four areas where you need to be an example. You need to uh, set an example in all things, showing yourself to be uh, to be a pattern of good work. Now, the Living New Living Translation says this. Uh, this renders this verse as this, and you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. So Paul is telling Titus that he should not just teach, but he should also show by example, you know, how uh, people ought to live. So his teaching will be taken seriously uh, if only he is living by what he is teaching. But if he is not living by what he is teaching, then no one will take him seriously. And it'll his whole ministry will be of no uh, use. And then he says, in doctrine, showing integrity. Uh, now this verse, um, the CEB uh, renders this verse as, be sincere and serious when you teach. The uh, ESV version says, when you teach, be honest and uh, uh, serious. And another version says, in your teaching, show integrity and uh, dignity. So hen, uh, hence we see that the word doctrine here in this, in this phrase, in doctrine showing integrity, is not referring to the context of the doctrine taught, uh, but has reference to the qualities of the teacher, the one who is teaching the doctrines uh, what is the qualities. So the words integrity and reverence are the attributes 
uh, that is mentioned here in reverence to the qualities of the teacher. So those who are teaching this doct uh, these doctrines or the truths in God's word, they should be people who are having these qualities of integrity and reverence towards God. So Titus is to teach God's word in all purity, with all sincerity, in faithfulness, in simplicity, and in honesty, um, in a dignified and a serious manner, so as to command respect for the word of God, so that people can take the word of God very, very uh, seriously. Okay? So that is verse 7. Uh, we look at verse 8 and then we move on to verses 9 to 10. Verse 8 says, Sound speech cannot be condemned that one whose opponent may be ashamed having nothing evil to uh, say. So he's saying that Titus, your teaching and your words must be so thoughtful. Uh, you should, you know, uh, say it in such a way that you're teaching the right truths of the doctrine from God's word so that nothing can be shown as unsound uh, or no one can find fault with your teaching, with the doctrine. Um, then, you know, even if somebody who is talking the false doctrines or is going against the truth in God's word, you know, or they're going even against Titus and his teaching, they will be ashamed and they will have nothing bad to say because you are speaking in line with what the word of God is saying, what the truth in God's word is uh, is, uh, is showing forth. And also you are not just speaking it, but you're living it. You're living that. And so, you know, no one will have anything bad to say to you. Okay. So even as we are looking at the characteristics of older men, older women, younger men, younger women, that's um, Paul is writing in the context of the Cretans in their time, in their situation, it's also these characteristics can also be very relevant uh, to us uh, in, our, in our time and age. So whichever category you belong to, you know, you can look at whether you have these characteristics and if not, you know, you can pray about it and you can start, you know, living these characteristics and asking the Holy Spirit to bring this about um, in your life. Any questions so far from verses uh, 1 to verse 8? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to verses 9 and 10, where he's talking about instructions to bond servants in the church. We already looked at this in uh, when Paul writes to Timothy, where he talks about how you know bond servants should be. So I'll just briefly mention this, and then we'll move on. Verses 9 and 10, can uh, someone read from Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, please? Titus chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. Exhorts bond servant to be obedient to their own, as master, own masters, to be well pleasing in all things, not answering back, not uh, preferring, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Okay, verses 9 and 10, he is exhorting uh, the born servants here. And, uh, you know, we know from what we studied in the book of Romans, uh, uh, also Timothy, we've studied quite in detail about uh, born servants and what Paul is instructing them and how he's asking them uh, to live. So here he's basically talking about born servants who have become uh, believers who have are part of the churches now so it's very strange uh, and it's only it's also shocking because it's only in the christian culture you know that bond servants and masters are sitting together and worshiping uh, god uh, and you know uh, so there's a, and it's only in this uh, in the church context you know that there's a mixing of slaves and their masters in the social setting of a church um, service so paul gives five waves that's, uh, that slaves need to uh, relate to their masters and here when you're saying about 
slaves. You're talking about believers, uh, uh, slaves, slaves who become Christians. So he says they need to be obedient uh, to their own masters, which I've already explained when we were studying um, the book of Timothy. Uh, they should be well-pleasing in all things. That means cheerful in their attitude, in their service, the, the way they serve. They should not be like the other serve, slaves or murmuring, grumbling, complaining, but cheerful doing their work cheerfully in all things, every in everything, at, at all times, you know, uh, uh, they need to serve their masters out of obedience to God. In every area, they should show human submission and obedience and submission is uh, their, one of their responsibilities, even as they are believers unto God, and they should show the same thing to their uh, masters as uh, well. And, you know, uh, in the, the slaves in that culture, you know, were tempted to be slack in their work and not be diligent. So, um, uh, and these Christian slaves can be, can think, you know, hey, after all, I explained to you when we were studying, I think in Second Timothy, you know, about when Paul writes uh, to uh, Timothy, sorry, in First Timothy chapter 6, you know, uh, where he says, um, you know, uh, how uh, believers, uh, 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 slaves, uh, should not uh, take their masters for granted and say, you know, anyway, he's uh, also a believer like me. He understands that, you know, I have to go for the prayer meeting. I have to go for the church service. And hence, I couldn't finish my work or the church service for so long. Or we had this fellowship. We had that fellowship. And so I couldn't finish my work. But, you know, don't make those things as an excuse. Don't be slack. Um, you know, uh, and we read this in First Timothy chapter six, uh, verse two, where Paul says, "If you know, if slaves have believing masters, they should serve them all the more, uh, because those who partake of the benefit are believers and uh, and beloved." So you know, you're serving your fellow brethren, so do it uh, uh, with all your heart, do your best, and don't answer back, don't uh, back mouth, don't uh, uh, gossip, uh, don't talk back to them. And then he says the fourth. Uh, characteristic that they need to have is not pilfering. Now the word pilfer means to misappropriate uh, or cheat or steal money or goods uh, from their master. Now, you know, slaves were uh, often entrusted with managing a little bit of family funds or purchasing some supplies for the household. And, you know, they could easily rationalize this way. You know, I'm living in poverty. And, you know, they are, my master and the family are living in luxury. They have so much of money. If I steal something a little bit, you know, it's not going to make any difference for them. It's going to help me. And so they justify themselves by saying that. And they say they won't miss a little bit if I use it for my um, self. And so this kind of practice was very common in the ancient world. And hence, in the ancient world, they used to use the words servant and thief very interchangeably you know so uh, they use a servant that means they're intending to say hey you're a thief because a, a slave or a servant would always uh, cheat their master and steal from their uh, master so you know uh, in small ways or even in big ways so uh, he says you know don't cheat or steal from your uh, master as believers set an example to the other slaves as well and then he says but showing all good Fidelity, that all means in all possible ways, you know, show fidelity. Uh, this, uh, the Greek word for fidelity means uh, faithfulness, soft, obliging. So this phrase basically means to act faithfully in every possible way, in all instances, in all occasions, not, uh, you know, uh, being a fraud, uh, not, you know, using uh, the money to cheat uh, the, your owner's money or your master's money and cheat them with it. Um, so a slave must act faithfully in all affairs of their master and not uh, cheat them. Now, why is Paul mentioning all these things so that, uh, you know, why is he mentioning all of these things is so that, you know, believers will stand out from the rest of the other slaves and, um, you know, they can set an example to them just like older men, older women, younger men, younger women should set an example the same way he's saying, hey, slaves, you're very much uh, 
part of us and you also need to set an example uh, to the other slaves. And he says, goes on to say, if believers sl slaves live their lives with these kind of qualities, these kind of characteristics, then what will it result in? You know, he goes on to say that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now, the way Paul says this is very beautiful. He says that they may adorn the doctrine of God. So the word adorn is used in a setting of a jewel. So it just basically means to, you know, arrange all of these precious jewels in such an orderly a manner, in such a perfect, beautiful manner that it can bring about the beauty of that piece of jewelry you know it's so important that you not just put stones anywhere but when you place it in sequence in specific order it just you know enhances the entire uh, beauty so paul is basically saying that christians slaves should order their lives with godly behavior uh, so that they are like these jewels in or these stones, these precious jewels uh, in this whole setting, uh, which just brings about the, the the grandeur of that jewelry piece. And uh, people are attracted to buy it. People want it. People want to wear it. And, you know, the same way when they order their lives uh, uh, in such a way, you know, people around them will be attracted to their uh, savior. And the life ministry, and the saving work of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross will be exhibited in all of its beauty uh, to the unbelieving world by their uh, godly um, conduct. Now, we often think that, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, we need to use, you know, great words, good words, the way we present our theology, the way we present our doctrine should be so excellent, should be so good. Yes, it's very important. Uh, in, uh, better words, import, uh, how we frame sentences, how we sh explain things uh, in God's word is important, yes. But, uh, you know, uh, more important is the life that is teaching those uh, doctrines. So when we are living those kind of lives and we're teaching that doctrine, it will be like those precious jewels that is orderly, arranged in an orderly manner to bring about the beauty in that jewelry uh, piece. So in this context, you know, the bond servant slaves who were brought, bought with money uh, were to be treated, uh, you know, we know that they were treated like animals. Um, they were not, they did not have any uh, say, they did not have any will, they did not have any rights. Um, and, uh, you know, but Paul is reminding these slaves, hey, even though you think you have no rights, you have no standing, uh, you know, uh, People don't even treat you as humans. You're treated like animals. But God, in God's design, you know, uh, you are somebody who has that potential, you know, to bring about that beauty of God's truth, of God's word in the way that you live because you are those precious jewels that can be used to, you know, uh, 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 portray the beauty, the grandeur, and the work, uh, the person and the work of Jesus Christ even through your um, lives okay so this is very beautiful what paul uh, explains uh, to them uh, even as we might not be slaves but you know i remember when we were, i was talking about we were teaching or i was sorry when i was teaching from first uh, timothy second timothy or we were studying uh, the book of timothy which paul writes we looked at this in detail and that I'm, I made a contrast about how we as uh, believers are, are all working in a workplace. We have all masters above us, how we need to relate to them. You know, we might not be slaves. It might not apply to us uh, in this context. But, you know, what Paul writes can apply to us in the context of us uh, being, um, you know, people who are working in a um, uh, uh, in an office or, uh, a, you know, we are employees, we have an employer, we have a, uh, a manager above us and how we need to relate to them, how we need to work, how we need to serve them, how we need to do our work. 
and uh, you know that is very very important and so we can draw lessons uh, from this even as I drew out lessons when we were studying the book of Timothy how we can be as employees and how we can relate to our employers and how we can uh, do our work okay so this means that we need to think about our behavior our attitude especially on the job uh, you know how uh, we work our attitude uh, you know will uh, actually you know and the way we live our lives the way we speak the way we relate to our colleagues the way we uh, uh, think the way we answer the way we uh, do our work will all you know will set an example of godliness to the unbelievers uh, you know and when they see our lives uh, it will just portray Christ likeness it will it will just lead them to Christ uh, if it does not, then, you know, they will speak ill of our, our religion, they'll speak ill of the God that we worship, uh, they will make fun of the, the truth that we believe in and also the God that we serve and we um, worship. Before we go on to verses 11 to 14, anyone has any questions? Any questions? No? Okay, uh, verses 11 to 14, uh, Titus chapter 2, can one of you please read that, please? Titus 2, 11 to 14. Titus 2, 11 to 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing for, of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Sell us for good works. Amen. Thank you, Asha. So here, uh, Paul is saying, you know, the grace of God brings salvation to all men. So what he's meaning is that, you know, all types of people, including those whom the world despises, even the slaves, even those who are, uh, you know, utterly indulging in sinful behavior, uh, who we think have absolutely no hope, you know, uh, he says all kind of people so no one is beyond the reach of god's grace god's grace can reach any kind of sinner in the depths of their uh, sin uh, he can uh, even uh, god the grace of salvation can reach any uh, 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 people in any strata of society any st any stage in life anyone whether they're slaves or they're masters or whether they're young or old whatever the grace of god is available to all men it does not mean that you know because the uh, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It doesn't mean that all men are automatically saved, but only those who accept the grace of God, those who believe in the finished work of Jesus and what he has done on the cross. But the good news of God's grace is that no sinner is beyond the reach of God's uh, grace. And then he says, the grace of God that brings uh, salvation so you don't go and get salvation, but salvation comes to you and you have the opportunity uh, to receive it. Verse 12, he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should be live soberly, righteously and godly in this uh, present age. Now he says, teaching us that the ancient word uh, for the ancient Greek word for the word teaching has in mind what a parent does for a child. So, you know, it speaks of uh, the entire training process which a parent, you know, gives a child. So a parent basically teaches, encourages, corrects and disciplines uh, a child all through their, um, uh, their life. So grace is a teacher. You know, the grace of God, what you're talking about, the grace of salvation. So the grace is a teacher in the sense. So the Greek word for teaching here is basically disciplining us, 
um, and uh, you know it's it also means encouraging teaching correcting and uh, disciplining as a parent would do to a, a child now the pa the passion translation for this verse says his same grace teaches us how to live each day so you know it, it says very beautifully in the passion translation helps us to understand better it says his same grace the same grace means the grace of God that brought us salvation is the same grace that teaches us how to live each uh, day. So it's the same grace that brought us salvation. It's the same grace that helped, enables us to overcome sin. Uh, it's the same grace that helps us to live our lives uh, each and every day um, and each and every moment of our uh, lives. And it's a process, you know, that begins from salvation and continues until we stand before the throne of God. Uh, so, you know, it, this whole grace of God is a process that is a process that involves teaching, encouragement, correction, and uh, disciplining. But we need to note that grace does not mean that we live and do as we wish, as we desire, but we know that from this, what I've just explained to you, that grace actually trains us, it disciplines us, it instructs us in godly living. Okay, And then Paul mentions three ways that grace trains us. The first way that grace trains us is to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, verse 12, the first half. The second thing is grace trains us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, the latter part of verse 12. And the third thing is that the grace trains us to live in godliness by looking ahead and behind, which we read in verses 13 and the first part of verse uh, 14. Okay, so we look at the three ways that grace trains us. Grace trains us firstly to live, uh, to deny ungodliness and worldly uh, desires. So when, you know, when we experience God's unmerited favor in Christ Jesus, it basically motivates us to want to please him in everything that we do. So even as we read God's word, we realize that there's so much, uh, in our life that displeases God, God's word points out, uh, it's like a mirror, it points out the sin in our life. And, you know, it shows us, you know, God has done so much for us on the cross. He's taken our sins upon himself on the cross to save us. And we are still living in the sinful habits or, you know, it, it kind of uh, corrects us, rebukes us. And then we begin to want to overcome that, uh, you know, and so we begin to we begin to do exactly that. We begin to deny, uh, you know, uh, our sins. We begin to deny ungodliness. And just like we read in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says, you know, when Jesus said, deny yourself daily, take up your cross and uh, follow him. So this includes saying no to ungodliness. Uh, you know, basically ungodliness is referring to a person who is openly immoral or evil, uh, but it can also include those who are outwardly very nice as people, you know, but have no place for God inside them. Inside them, you know, they are basically living very unholy, unrighteous, ungodly uh, lives. They have no place for God. So he's saying that, um, you know, in every day of our life, we need to be motivated uh, uh and be encouraged to live our lives for God and, uh, you know, live godly lives and not live ungodly uh, and not to uh, uh, live according to the people of this world who are living to fulfill the passions and desires of their uh, flesh. The second thing is that, the gr that grace trains us to live sensibly, righteously and godly in this present age. So, uh, it's not enough to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires, but we must also uh, say yes to sensible, righteous, godly living so that those in the world will be attracted to our Savior, will be attracted to Christ, will be attracted to the cross. Now, sensibly refers to how we are to exercise self-control uh, in our very lives. 
uh, and righteously has to do with uh, living our life of integrity and uprightness in the way we deal with others. And godly refers to, you know, uh, our love and reverence towards God. Uh, it basically denotes holiness in thought and act. So living in a godly manner according to the word of God, the will of God, both in public and private so that God can be glorified. So when you live sensibly, you are, you know, exercising self-control over yourself. When you are living righteously, you're living a life of integrity and uprightness, which is dealing with uh, others. When you're living a godly life, it's basically referring to your love and reference towards God, which denotes holiness in thought and in uh, act. Okay. Then the third thing that grace trains us is to live in godliness, looking ahead and uh, behind. Okay, so looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it's looking forward towards the coming uh, of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and also in, in, involves a backward look. It's a backward look is toward the cross and its implication in our lives. So the first thing here in the, uh, the third way that grace trains us is to look ahead, you know, at the blessed hope of Christ's second coming. So the grace that brings salvation, uh, you know, uh, uh, which brought about salvation uh, when Christ came uh, in flesh, the incarnate God, God becoming flesh, his glory was almost veiled, which means we did not see the glory of God, but we know from John chapter 17, Jesus manifested the sonship glory and he gave us that uh, sonship glory. So his glory was of deity was veiled. We could not see his um the glory of deity if he if god if jesus came in the glory of deity he could not he we could not touch him see him tangibly experience him relate with him uh, but you know it was his glory was mostly veiled but the second appearing you know will be in his full glory uh, and when people see it you know many of them will be saved uh, but those who do not believe in him, you know, there will be a terrifying judgment uh, for them. So the second coming is a blessed hope for all those who believe in him, uh, because, you know, it, we will fully experience all of the blessings of salvation, which means we will experience or taste eternal life in its fullest form uh, at uh, when the second coming of Jesus Christ. So if our focus in everything that we do, say, and how we live is to, you know, looking forward to that glorious hope. Hey, that, you know, I want to see, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, Christ's second coming. I want to be part of that eternal hope, uh, eternal life experience that then that will lead us to live pure lives and uh, flee from every kind of sin and uh, temptation. So, you know, our focus is to be set on our hope in Christ's return. And when we focus on that, it will purify our life from every known sin that we read in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. And then in verse 14, he says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good work. So the second part of this third thing that grace can do for us is the backward look. So we look at the forward look, which is looking at the second coming of Jesus Christ, looking at in hope where we will live eternally with him. We will experience eternal life in its fullest form. But also this, the grace, the third aspect of what grace uh, does to us, how grace trains us, is the backward look is, you know, looking back to the supreme demonstration of Christ's love or God's love uh, on the cross, which redeemed us from sin and made us his own possession. So here in verse 14, it says, who gave himself uh, for us. So the who, who here refers to God, our Savior, Jesus Christ himself, who gave himself for us. So note, the is referring to Christ. 
the gift is the gift that he gave us is he gave us himself and the person for who he gave himself for is for us so three things that we can see is the is referring to christ the gift is referring to christ himself who gave himself as a gift to us the person for whom he gave himself is for each one of us so first christ gave himself for us to redeem us uh, from every lawless deed uh, and you know to redeem us um, uh, from being slaves of sin and satan and this was something which the word redeem was something that was uh, uh you know uh very applicable for the people uh, uh and the context in which uh, or the audience that paul is writing to because you know uh, many of these slaves they know this word redeem they know what it uh, ways for them, what it carries, what it brings for them. It basically brings them total freedom from slavery to being, uh, you know, uh, uh, individuals themselves to experiencing freedom. So they know what this word redeem is, word redeem is, and hence Paul is using this word redeem. But for us, you know, uh, even as we are slaves to sin, slaves to Satan, you know, Christ redeemed us. He paid the redemption price by his own blood, set us free from the bondage of sin and when he has done that you know how could we ever think of going back and sinning or indulging in sin uh, when we are so mindful of what christ has done so that is why we're saying you know in the first hour when we had the first lecture says you know it, it's important for us to focus our eyes on what christ has done on the cross and what we have received as an inheritance the accomplished work of the cross and what he has done for us on the cross the second thing is christ gave himself for us that he might purify for himself a people for his own uh, uh, to be his own special uh, people so the verse uh, 12 you know is focused on our need to purify ourselves but verse 14 uh, basically focuses on Christ purifying us uh, through his blood. So, you know, um, Christ purchased us or bought us from the slave market of sin uh, by paying a heavy price, giving his very life. He washed our sin and now we belong to him as his personal and prized um, possessions. Okay. And... Um, and hence, you know, Paul goes on to say that, uh, you know, there's another thing that uh, grace can do to us. So the fourth thing that grace can do to us or train us is that it trains us, uh, it trains those who are saved to be zealous for good deeds. Okay, so another way, way that grace trains us, the fourth thing it trains us is uh, it saves, uh, you know, those who are saved, it helps us to be zealous for good things. That is, he mentions this in the latter half of verse 14, uh, where he says, you know, uh, purify himself for his own special people, zealous for uh, good things. So zealous means zealous in doing and promoting good works. Uh, so good deeds refers to deeds that are done out of sincere love, uh, for God and others in obedience to the word of God. So if we are bought, you know, out of the slave market of sin, out of the slave market uh, of Satan, uh, and we are bought and purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we are, you know, uh, and this is, we receive this by grace, it's a gift of God, uh, then we should be zealous for good works, for good deeds, and which means that we need to be totally devoted uh, in every area of our life in just pleasing God and doing uh, what honors Him, glorifies Him, and what would, uh, you know, display him in and through our lives display christ's likeness in and through our uh, lives okay we have one more verse uh, verse 15 that will end titus chapter 2 but we have no time we'll look at it uh, next week but anyone has any questions no questions
So I hope all that we learned today uh, is very relevant, how we need to live our lives in whichever stage of life that we are in, you know, how we need to uh, work our mindset, our attitudes that we need to have as employers, uh, working for, uh, you know, our masters and also our master and also how we uh, need to live our lives uh, knowing you know what Christ has done for us focus on the cross what he's purchased for us and uh, you know um, what we have received as our inheritance as our blessing and knowing how grace trains us and be willing to yield to and be submissive to the grace of God in the various areas that he teaches us and trains us so I hope we are able all of us you know including me are able to apply everything that uh, we learn in our own personal lives and not thinking it's just there for uh, people at Crete, not relevant for me, but very relevant for us and how we can apply it. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, um, for this class. Um, and uh, thank you for your feedback. I'll post your assessment on Wednesday. You can send it end of day on uh, Friday. I hope that's okay with all of you. I know Friday is a very busy uh, day for all of us and this whole week will be busy for some of you as pastors, Passion Week, but is it okay for all of you to do the assessments this uh, Wednesday? Most of you said, 12 of you said it's fine, so we'll go ahead with it, but anyone still has a say, you can always say. If not, we'll go ahead. Ma'am, can we uh, uh, like have it for next week as well? Uh, the end date. Oh, next week end date. No, that's too too many days. Oh, okay. So yeah, can we extend it for a little bit then? Uh, but most of them say it's okay. Uh, Twelve of them now. I have thirteen of them. What okay. what is difficult, Rupa? Can I hear from you, please? Oh, uh, this is Divya, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I know yeah. Divya. You, yeah, but even Rupa has mentioned. Uh, oh, it's difficult. Mandy says it's not okay, Pastor. Okay. Yeah, for us, uh, yeah, actually, this. Uh, okay, so can I post it on Thursday and then can you return it on Saturday, end of day? Is that okay? Or do you want to do it next week? Actually, from, uh, for me, I, I, I'll I just say, like, I, we have travel plans, so I'm not sure how I'll be able to uh, do it. You yeah. informed me that late, uh, you should have. You should have messaged or informed me earlier. Uh, next week, how about the others? Is next week okay? Many of them have left class. Next week, only two of you say next week. Three of you are next week. Okay, next week. Okay, then we'll have it next week, everyone. So next week, when can I post it? The same time that you said, uh, Pastor. Will Wednesday work. to Friday. Uh huh. Yeah, that's what that works well. Okay. Okay, then we'll do it next week, next Wednesday to Friday. All of you have a happy uh, Passion Week, and uh, you'll be blessed by everything that you hear and serve and receive, and um, you know as you ponder on the cross. God bless you all. Happy Easter, everyone. In advance, God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor. Happy Easter. Thank you, Divya. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Stavini. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.